at 13, like, I didn't have anything, like, weirdly off about me or anything. I was a total normal 13-year-old girl, right? But I struggled with some pretty normal 13-year-old girl things, being, like, self-esteem issues, body image issues. And then I would turn to pornography to try to fix that, even though I knew it would never actually fix it. It was just a temporary fix. Yeah. Well, Maddie, thank you so much for joining us in the studio today. We're so happy to have you here. Thanks for having me. Of course. (laughs) Um, So before we kind of dive into, you know, your story and why you're here with Fight the New Drug on our podcast, can you tell us a little bit about who you are, what life was like growing up for you, just to kind of contextualize this conversation a bit? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Yeah, my name is Maddie. I'm 19 years old, and I love... Uh, being outside, like all things outside, hiking. Um, I love weightlifting and I love all things music, like collecting records, playing guitar and electric guitar and singing, just all the good stuff. Awesome. (laughs) Who are some of your favorite musical influences? Ooh, okay. Top one, I gotta say Pink Floyd. Nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. We love to hear it. Yes. Love Pink Floyd. Probably also Led Zeppelin. Nice. Awesome. Jams. <laughs> Very cool. Um, are you a vinyl? Yes. A vinyl listener? Yes. Collector? Okay. Yes. Love vinyl. <laughs> Very cool. I love that. Well, um, we're here to talk a little bit today about your por- personal story and, and your perspective that you can share on the harms of pornography. So um, to kind of dive right in, do you want to tell us a little bit about, about your experiences? Yeah, for sure. So I was... I first found pornography when I was 13, and when I first found it, it was pretty, like, there was a lot of mixed feelings that I have. Um, I grew up in a religious household, and so I knew that that was against my personal belief system, and I, you know, I felt, like, kind of excitement and kind of, like, a little bit nervous, like, oh my gosh, no one can ever find this, but the overwhelming feeling that I had was just shame, and that kind of kept me in this cycle with pornography for a long, long time. And I felt like I had kind of an extra layer of shame added because I was experiencing that as a woman. And I had always just kind of heard that, oh, that's a guy's problem, you know, boys will be boys, everything like that. And had never heard a women's perspective. And I remember, I, I knew that there was no one I was gonna turn to to talk about this like I was not gonna ask my parents I was not gonna talk to my friends um because what would they think of me right so obviously I turned to the all-knowing internet and I basically just googled like is it okay for women to view pornography or something like that or girls to view pornography and of course the all-knowing internet said yeah that's just fine right and it was hard because I kind of had like I knew deep down like this doesn't make me feel good about myself. Um, Like it was a very temporary solution to some other problems that I was dealing with. And so, um, and so, yeah, after like Googling that, I I obviously knew that like my personal beliefs didn't align with that, but it was hard to hear that. Yeah. um, And like reconcile that. Yeah. And I mean, you just said so many things that are key. We talk to a lot of women who have had a struggle with pornography and that is one kind of universal thing that we hear is the added shame of being a woman experiencing this because it's really normalized for men to um, experience a pornography habit in our society, but not as much for women. So there's kind of that added layer. And also you were how old when you first? Um, 13. 13 years old. And so um, this started a cycle for how, how long? Probably like uh four or five years four or five years yeah and you mentioned um you stayed in the cycle because it was kind of temporarily you were you were seeking out pornography as a way to yeah cope with maybe some other things can you tell us a little bit about yeah those so like the things that I was trying to cope with definitely changed over the years I think at 13 like I didn't have anything like weirdly off about me or anything I was a total normal 13 year old girl right but I struggled with some pretty normal 13 year old girl things being like self-esteem issues body image issues and um just you know in middle school and everything you're trying to figure out who you are but when you have that added 
when pornography is added to the mix and it's like this, I mean, I think Fight the New Drug calls it like the super normal stimulus, right? And you have that added into your mix of just life, it makes things really complicated. So pornography at that time was trying to act as kind of a solution to that problem that I had. Later on, the problems, rather than being self-esteem or body image issues, they turned into things like stress from high school or like um, problems with dating or things like that, that I just needed to escape. Sometimes it was even just boredom, right? Yeah. And just having like unstructured time. And then I would turn to pornography to try to fix that, even though I knew it would never actually fix it. It was just a temporary fix. Yeah. And by temporary, you mean like in in the moment that, you know, short term solution, mm-hmm. but maybe long term, it was kind of perpetuating some oh, yeah, of those. Totally. And it was like definitely more harmful in the long run because it was like that it's just like a cycle of shame right and so you feel bad maybe about yourself about some aspect of your life you view pornography and then you feel worse and then it just keeps going further down and down and down yeah going back when you were first exposed to pornography do you remember like your reaction to it like did you know what it was when you saw it yeah it was kind of it was kind of like a slow burn like with because the initial exposure to pornography was on social media I remember that Mm -hmm. and I like I knew that like that was sex but because I had had like the talk but it was like a one-time talk and it was just kind of like general (laughs) overview and then I saw that and I was like oh my gosh what is this and then it just further led into like actively seeking it out because I think the general initial feeling was just curiosity like course right like what what is going on here um and it like you know obviously like we're all human and you have those natural responses and so I thought that those natural responses that I was having made me like some gross and dirty 13 year old girl like are you kidding me like there I am not supposed to be feeling these things um and again just ties into shame yeah so that shame was kind of perpetuated and then how did you combat that shame or or eventually start to overcome this challenge with pornography? Yeah, I think there were two main things for me. One was mindfulness, which sounds mm-hmm. like, you know, kind of weird when we're no, talking about <laughs> solving pornography. But um, I, mindfulness, meaning like when I would feel the urge to view pornography, taking a second and asking like why am I feeling this urge like what emotion am I trying to avoid what was I doing like two hours ago five minutes ago um when was the last time I like talked to someone that I love you know and so just seeing what factors played into actually um like my you know unwanted pornography use was really helpful in actually solving that problem um and then the second thing is connection I think, and just starting to talk to people. Because I think mindfulness got me only so far, but it wasn't until I started talking to people and sharing my experience and hearing other people's experience and realizing, oh my gosh, like we were all just going through the same thing and no one talked about it. (laughs) Was That was really impactful. Yeah. And I think, I mean, part of the reason we're so glad you're here today, right, is because the more we can share these stories, the more we can help break down those barriers for other people as well. Um, But I'm particularly interested in um, how you kind of overcame this shame cycle, because I think it's something that um, a lot of people, that is the reason that, you know, they use pornography to cope with stress or boredom or Mm -hmm. any of the things you've listed. Um, And then shame is really kind of the cycle that keeps so many people stuck. And so Mm -hmm. um, was there like a particular moment for you that you said, okay, you know, today's the day that I'm going to make a change. Yeah, there was. So when I look at this shame cycle, I kind of look at it of like as like three steps. So one is I would feel out of touch with like some certain part of my identity. And then two, I would view pornography to cope with that. And then three, I would feel shame and a need to isolate and then, you know, feel out of touch with your identity. And it just repeats and repeats. So I think for years I looked at that those three steps and I looked at the second step viewing pornography to cope and I said okay if I can just take that out then I will have it solved and that led to a lot of willpower and a lot of like people call it like white knuckling and just trying to force your way out of it and it was really hard because 
then I would fall back into it and I would think that that's, you know, there's something wrong with me, yeah. you know, because that works in every other aspect of my life. Like if I just want to get better at something, I'm going to work harder at it. Right. And so the fact that this wasn't working, I was like, oh, my gosh, like there must just be something wrong with me. And again, that just ties back to the first step of identity. Yeah. Right. And so it wasn't until I started looking at the first step of feeling out of touch with my identity that things actually started to change. Um, I, I connected with just this trusted adult in my life and I kind of told him what was going on and I was like, what, you know, what do I do? As soon as I had told him through a lot of tears right. <laughs> what had been going on, he just assured me of a couple of things. He said that I was not a bad person and that I was still just as loved and I was still just as valued. And hearing those things was so cool for me because it was so much of what was being said, but it was also so much of what was not being said. He didn't tell me, oh my gosh, like that's really gross, right? (laughs) Nothing like that. He just told me who I was and reminded me who I was. And as simple as that sounds, that really was so impactful for me. Yeah. And I think that's, it's so important because if you had known that as a 13 year old, maybe, you know, or been able to talk with a trusted adult sooner, do you think that would have changed what you're your journey looked like? Yeah, I think so. And that's also the crazy thing is sometimes I'll have parents ask me like, well, you know, why isn't my kid talking to me about this and whatever? And the thing was like my parents, I knew for a fact that if I came to them, they would have received it so well. Like they have so much love for me. I know they would have been completely supportive when I eventually did tell them they were great about it. But that wasn't like, I think it's important for parents to understand that's not a problem with them or the way they're parenting. It was just a matter of my personal, like, shame and the, the guilt I felt around it that I didn't tell them. Um, and so, yeah, I think if I were able to connect with someone earlier, it would have, you know, led me down a different path, but I'm also really grateful for the path that it led me down today. I think that's such a good point you make. You know, so many parents feel like, Well, in a lot of cases, parents don't make themselves approachable or safe to talk to about this. So that is something that we want to encourage parents to do. But even in the cases where, you know, young people know their parents will be receptive, there is still just so much stigma and so much shame that it just makes it difficult to reach out sometimes. So um, is there anything that you feel like, you know, any other trusted adult could have done or said to you sooner to, to make you feel more comfortable to open up to them that that someone listening could maybe say what could I do that would make my child approach me yeah I think honestly like um just like opening up that conversation and opening it up in a way that's like you know knowing that it's not a matter of if but when your children see pornography and it's just like you know, like, when was the last time you encountered pornography and making it, like, super casual and stuff like that, I think would have been really helpful for me. I don't know if I would have opened up on the sure. first couple of times that they asked me, but just knowing that that's an open line of communication would have been really helpful. Um, I also think, and I don't really have a solution for this one, but one of the, like, more harmful things was even, like, my trusted adult that I ended up opening up to, a lot of times him and other other just adults in my life would say oh my gosh like you're so awesome like you're so perfect and stuff Mm. like that and then you know of course that's meant to be as a compliment of course they didn't have any bad intent with that but hearing that sometimes internally I'm like well if only they knew Right. right if only they knew and so maybe like saying things like that but also being like you are great like exactly as you are whatever you're struggling with like there's just so much love to go around regardless of what you're struggling with. I yeah. think knowing that would have been awesome. Yeah, that's really good advice. So two things. One, to have this be an ongoing conversation as opposed to kind of one time you have the talk. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what a lot of parents do. That's what a lot of, you know, our parents were raised in an environment where if they even had a talk, it was kind of a significant thing, but many of them didn't even. So it's yeah. kind of like we often hear like, yeah, it was just a one-time conversation that was never to be spoken about again. And so maybe just having that regular ongoing conversation um, and then also leaving some room for, you know, mistakes or or not being afraid to disappoint someone by having them having an expectation of you. Totally. Um, I think that's really... Yeah. And even like 
to add on to that, just, like, embracing mistakes. Not even, like, pornography-wise, but just in general and seeing, yeah. like, failure as an opportunity for growth in general, I think is awesome. Also, I just want to caveat all of this by saying I'm giving parenting advice and I'm not a parent, so... <laughs> That's okay. I'm not a parent yourself. either, so... But oh, we good. talk with a lot of parents, especially on these good. issues, and, and I think having been a young person who experienced this, you do have a unique lens that could help some parents as well. Um, totally. Uh, to know how to approach this. You mentioned that you were first exposed to pornography on social media. And um, can you tell us a little bit about what the environment is like on social media for you currently, what you're seeing among your friends? And, um, you know, we often get asked by parents or by young people, the dangers of social media and pornography. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think... um like, regardless of what your interests are, regardless of what you're seeing on your, like, for you page or anything, like, pornography is just there. And I think understanding that, like, again, it's just not an if, but a when. You know, I remember seeing those things on my social media feed and being like, being like well, they have algorithms and that's targeted to me. So therefore, yeah. like, there must be something wrong with me or something like that. Um, but yeah, I just think understanding that, like, it is so prevalent. Like, kids are seeing if they're on social media or have like any internet access there is like almost no way that they are not seeing pornography at least like once a week once a day like it is so 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 prevalent and it's not a lot of it is in unintentional so. yeah and I think that's I mean such a good reminder it's not if it's when um even in scenarios where there are filters set up or all, you know, any, any safety measures to protect young kids, especially little kids, mm -hmm. um, are good. But did you have filters on your devices? Had you had, um, were your parents aware of kind of how accessible pornography was on social media at the time you were exposed? Yeah. I think they were fairly aware. I, I like, as far as if I had filters or not, I think I did, but that's kind of blurry. Um, I know that I put my phone in my, my parents' room at night, mm -hmm. And looking back, that was really helpful yeah. because a lot of times when I was like most susceptible to it was at night, you know, you're alone, it's dark, everything like that. And you're like isolated. Um, but yeah, as far as like filters, I think that's as that's what I remember from my parents. But looking back, I'm thankful for them rather yeah. than resentful yeah. <laughs> about them. Yeah. But regardless, to your point, you know, kids are seeing it weekly even yeah. on different social media platforms and it is something to be aware of um yeah. now, can I add a point yes please Sorry. and I think um a lot of times for parents when like approaching this issue of pornography it's like a really scary thing and it you know it is a really scary thing because it's like you know we have to figure this whole new thing out now and I think just for parents understanding that both the parents and the kids are still figuring it out and so approaching it like you and your kid versus this problem, not you versus your kid is really helpful. Um, and I also think like focusing on, oh my gosh, like what filters are the best? I think that your energy is better spent, like building a good enough relationship with your kid that when they do see it, they feel comfortable enough to talk to you about it. Again, so much easier said than done. But. Sure. <laughs> but great advice, you yeah. know, I mean, that's any kind of tool that can help with monitoring or filtration or boundaries, even putting your phone in your parents' room at night or whatever that is, mm -hmm. all are great, you know, tips. Um, but I think you're kind of going back to what we always say, which is it's not if it's when and that ongoing conversation, making sure that there is a trusted adult who who you kids will come to instead of just Googling mm -hmm. um, things is kind of always the encouragement. So it's totally. good a reinforcement of that, I think. Um, and to, just to note, um, I really like that you said you figuring things out with your kids as opposed to y you being against each other. You're on the same team kind of against the internet, essentially. Totally. And I think that's a really helpful perspective as well. This is going back a little bit to you mentioned um, you had some self-esteem and some body image things. You know, we know that research shows that pornography, especially for women consuming, um, can negatively affect those things, but also can affect mental health. Can you talk a little bit about when you were kind of in the depths of this challenge and also already struggling with those things, the influence pornography had? Yeah. Um, a lot of times when I would like view pornography the most or the most frequently was on days when I had a ton of like unstructured time 
and it would usually follow like scrolling on social media for a while and then you know that scrolling wasn't enough I guess for my brain and then I turned to pornography like there I remember there being days where I don't know if I really made the link in my brain that it was pornography that was doing this to my brain but I remember there were days when like I was so just unmotivated to do anything and it was like the things that you know like hanging out with my family being with my friends the things that are usually like really fun and like being outside but just nothing really seemed to like excite me anymore and then as soon as I started like solving those underlying issues and therefore solving the pornography use life got so much more like exciting and those things actually were fun to me um and I think that's I'm not like a neuroscientist or <laughs> scientist or anything but I've just heard of like the you know your dopamine baseline right and it it peaks with the pornography use and then it goes back down even lower yeah. and just keeps getting lower and lower and lower and so looking back that kind of makes sense of like why those activities weren't really you know that fun to me anymore yeah why your mental health declined a bit and the things that would typically bring you joy you you didn't feel that in those things yeah um and that's a I mean research shows that and a lot of personal experiences from individuals who've struggled with pornography kind of validate that as well. So I think that's helpful for anyone maybe listening who is struggling with pornography and who is experiencing that cycle themselves to know that there's hope on the other side of things and that, um, you know, as many people who are overcoming a challenge with pornography will often talk about replacing the habit with something else and how that can kind of build healthy habits again. Is that something that you found um, if you replaced the habit with something else mm -hmm. over time, that helped. Yeah. And I had to figure out how to, like replacing the habit was super helpful with me, but I had to figure out how to do that the right way. Cause a lot of times it was like replacing it to just avoid it in the moment. Sure. Right. And like completely like suppress it. And then the pornography would just come back up again. Yeah. Um, but figuring out how to like like, it's a, it's a hard skill to learn, but figuring out how to, you know, maybe just go on a walk or go hang out with your family and still just allow that, like, I guess, urge to view pornography to be there. And then eventually, like, it passes, you know? Yeah. And so figuring that out is, that was, like, one of the most crucial things. To yeah, being able recover. to practice mm -hmm. experiencing that, but not having to give into it mm -hmm. and, and still being okay after. Totally. Yeah, yeah. that's really helpful to hear. Um, so you mentioned a little bit earlier that being a woman who was struggling with this and not having a lot of other resources for you, you experienced extra shame. Is there anything that you would tell women or young girls who are maybe are experiencing this, who might be listening, um, that you wish someone had said to you when you were younger? Yeah, there is a lot of things. I Let's hear it. <laughs> um, I would probably just first off tell them that they are not alone. Um, you're not the only person in the world struggling with this. There's nothing wrong with you for struggling with this. Um, and a lot of times I remember I would sometimes hear these things just said in a general sure. sense, like, oh, you know, you're loved, you're whatever. And I would hear those things and I'm like, okay, cool. That's for everyone else, <laughs> not me. Right. Sure. But just understanding that, yes, like every single individual, like, you know, you have worth and it's not a lot of times pornography tries to take away from that and boil your worth down to just objectively your body. And you have so much more worth than that. And um, just to step out of isolation and connect with someone. And um, I would encourage anyone who is listening to this to take that first leap of courage. I know it's scary, but to talk to someone that you trust and that you love and just that there's a lot of hope and and there's a lot of good life to be lived. Yeah, very well said. And something that you're doing now is sharing your story and hearing the stories of other women. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of your advocacy now? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I run a podcast and I guess like an Instagram account called Sisters on the Front Lines. And so essentially it's obviously women-based. Um, I love men too. Of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's... Essentially, it's just I have conversations with young women and with like experts like um, 
therapists and professors and everything like that just about pornography and I'll interview the young women about their experience with pornography and just kind of their journey of recovery and a lot of them are still struggling with it which I say all the better share your experiences right um just because I think it's really important and um I know that if I would have found that at 13 and been able to hear that then that would have been really um impactful and so if I'm able to make that impact in another 13 or 8 year old or 24 year old's life then awesome (laughs) yeah I think that's such a good reminder we often hear from I mean women and men who say well I really don't feel like I can be a fighter, which is what we call our our followers or activists in this movement, um, until I'm fully recovered. And it's like, who better to understand the harms of pornography and to, you know, speak out against those harms than someone who is experiencing this or has experienced this to any degree. So such a good reminder that you don't have to be kind of fully recovered um, to be able to share a story and, and speak out about Totally. And I think there's even like those are the most beautiful stories that I get to witness. And they're like, this is what I'm learning. This is what I still have to learn. But there's always so much strength and power from exactly where they stand. Yeah. So looking who you are now versus kind of who you were when you were really in the struggle, can you kind of tell us what the biggest differences you see are? Um, I would say one of the biggest differences is just like my happiness and like um probably my ability to just appreciate like simplicity of life and I think when I was struggling with pornography again like with you know that baseline dopamine like those things just weren't making the cut yeah but now being able to just go outside be still in nature and go on hikes and spend time with my family and stuff like that I think I'm a lot more appreciative of those things And I think that's with pornography and that's also with social media. Like I found when I limit the amount of time that I'm on social media, because I do run the social media for Sisters on Front Lines, but I was so reluctant to do that because I, I don't know, I just, I don't like the influence that social media has on my brain. Mm. Um, And so I found that when I, when I spend less time on social media and, you know, with pornography, then I'm able to just enjoy life more. Yeah. And I think that's such a good, um, for anyone who is kind of in the depths of a pornography struggle, that's such a good reminder of how much um, you can gain, you know, by by recovering from a, a pornography consumption habit. Totally. Um, so that's great. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> is there anything else we haven't talked about that um, you feel is beneficial to to share about your experience or advice you have for someone who, who is in a similar mm. situation? Um, yeah, I think I touched on this a little bit before, but I just want to emphasize, like, a lot of times you hear these things maybe on social media or you see these things and you see them and you think, well, I'm the exception to that. And I just want to emphasize the point of, like, you are absolutely not the exception to that. And just that finding your, figuring your, your way out of this pornography struggle is actually, like, a beautiful process and being able to learn what sexuality is the right way is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just, yeah, just that there's a lot of hope to be had. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It was such an, an honor, truly, <laughs> and a delight to get to talk with you. Um, I am sure our listeners and followers will gain so much from hearing your story and your experience. And also just a good reminder for anyone who's struggling or has struggled um, that by sharing your own story, you can you can help others out and help kind of break those barriers of shame and and help us change the conversation um, mm-hmm. so that other people can can find the joy that you have found now on the other side of this. So thank you so much. Thank you. I can't believe I'm here. I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> We're thrilled you're here. <laughs> Because of desensitization, many porn consumers find themselves consuming more porn, consuming more often, or consuming more extreme forms of pornography. In fact, according to a 2016 study, researchers found that 46.9% of respondents reported that over time, they began watching pornography that had previously disinterested or even disgusted them. 
Get more fast facts about the impacts of pornography and exploitation at ftnd.org forward slash fast facts. That's ftnd.org forward slash fast facts. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Consider Before Consuming is brought to you by Fight the New Drug. Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and a non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science, facts, and personal accounts. Check out the episode notes for resources mentioned in this episode. If you find this podcast helpful, consider subscribing and leaving a review. Consider Before Consuming is made possible by listeners like you. If you'd like to support Consider Before Consuming, you can make a one-time or recurring donation of any amount at ftnd.org forward slash support. That's ftnd.org forward slash support. Thanks again for listening. We invite you to increase your self-awareness, look both ways, check your blind spots, and consider before consuming.